Amid all the fun being published about Bitcoin, the latest is that it was hacked and cracked by the FBI in their seizure of approximately $2.3 million worth of the asset that was used as ransom in the U.S. Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack in early May. On this episode of Crypto Talk Tuesday, we're going to get into some of the details of how they were actually able to recover the funds and how the fund of ransomware is growing because of Bitcoin is absolutely false. Let's get scholared. Welcome to another episode of Crypto Talk Tuesday. I'm your host, Mario Johnson, president of Crypto Cost Scholars, LLC. And first of all, I want to apologize to you guys for missing last week. Um, we had some really bad weather come through and uh, severe lightning storms and I actually took out one of my, um, my pieces of network equipment. So I wasn't able to, um, I had originally scheduled to delay the uh, the session for uh, a few hours, but unfortunately, uh, because of the network equipment that had gotten taken out, I had to pretty much just, you know, reschedule the entire thing. And here we are today. So we're actually going to be, um, talking about something that right now is a little dated. I say it's about a week or two dated. Um, because again, it was my plans for last week's session, but still something of, uh, that's valuable. It's still something that I, I you know, um, definitely want to have a conversation about. So um, let's go ahead and get our our friend and uh, my friend, especially uh, the disclaimer out of the way so that we don't have any issues from, you know, any uh, regulatory uh, uh, committees or anything like that. <laughs> I doubt they're going to be knocking on my door, but just in case you never know. So. Um, the information contained herein is for informational and or educational purposes only. Nothing shall be construed uh, to be financial, legal, or tax advice. The content of this video is solely the opinion of myself, the speaker, who is not a, finance, who is not a licensed financial advisor or registered investment advisor. Remember, guys, trading cryptocurrencies possess a considerable risk of loss. Me, nor Crypto Scholars LLC, offer any guarantee of any particular outcome. So now that that's out the way, like I said... Um, I really wanted to talk about this issue because, um, again, it just kind of plays into the narrative. And for those who aren't, you know, uh, I guess you could say will, uh, s somewhat versed in how cryptocurrency, uh, as a whole, and in particular, Bitcoin, uh, operates and, you know, uh, pretty much uh, it's, uh, I guess the technicals, um, uh, behind, uh, you know, the protocols involved, like how, you know, Bitcoin, um, actually exists. Um, it, it can be, um, a turnoff, you know, it can be very misleading. Um, so I'm sure you guys remember, uh, the times where we had the, 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 the gas crisis, you know, where, um, the, the pipeline, everything got hacked and they had a big shutdown. Um, you know, which caused a, a huge panic, you know, you had guys, people actually, you know, putting gas in plastic bags. It was really weird. Um, so, yeah, that all started from what they claim to have been a ransomware attack. And for those who aren't familiar with exactly what, uh, ransomware is, um, that's actually, um, reference to FBI's website here from FBI.gov, uh, which kind of gives a, a bit of a description of what ransomware truly is. So, um, per the site, it says ransomware is a type of malicious software or malware that prevents you from accessing your computer files, systems, or networks and demands you pay, excuse me, a ransom for their return. Ransomware attacks can cause constant, can cause costly disruptions to operations and the loss of critical information and data. You can unknowingly download ransomware onto a computer by opening an email attachment, clicking an ad, following a link, or even uh, visiting a website that's embedded with ransomware. Once the code is loaded on the computer, it will lock access to the computer itself or data and files stored them, or stored there. More menacing versions can encrypt files and folders on local drives, attached drives, and even network computers. Most of the time, you don't know your computer has been infected. You usually discover it when you can no longer access data, um, when you can no longer access your data, or you can see 
or you see computer messages letting you know about the attack and demanding uh, ransom payments. Now, I work in the IT field, as, as you guys may know, I'm a computer engineer. So, um, you know, security is of the utmost importance. And our InfoSec uh, department has to deal with, you know, uh, the, ensuring that we are as protected as possible from these types of uh, events taking place, you know, from, um, you know, Trojans uh, coming into the network uh, that can potentially lead to some type of ransom, um, ransomware infection. And it's really big that you educate your staff on um, the, I guess, the vulnerabilities that are presented in, you know, clicking links and emails, uh, going to unconfirmed websites, you know, things of that sort. Um, we do really well in locking down the use of external um, devices in regards to like um, USB drives, the flash drives, things like that, uh, things that you can plug into the network. So um, those are ways that I guess the system can get infected with the ransomware. Um, it's really important that, and this is, I'm speaking to um, those of you who um, maybe run like a small mom and pop shop or are in the, uh, the IT field, it's really important that you have solid backups um, of your, all your data. You know, if you're running in a virtual environment that you have uh, consistent snapshots of your, your, your virtual systems, your virtual servers, and you test those uh, frequently because you never know when you may find yourself in this type of situation where, you know, someone's inadvertently, you know, one of your employees, maybe even yourself, uh, inadvertently clicked on a link. Um, and now all of a sudden you have um, a, a, a virus, for lack of a better word, um, on, in your network that has encrypted very critical system data and may have even locked you out of your system. Now, the biggest thing is that you're able to get those systems back online as quickly as possible. Find out, you know, what data uh, may have been um, may have been read, may have been infiltrated, and um, you know, doing what you have to do in order to recover uh, that information. So, like I said, as of late, uh, we were dealing with this happening with the uh, the Colonial Pipeline, which. It's said to have been, it is the second largest, if I'm not mistaken, the second largest pipeline um, in the United States. And it covers the general part of the Northeast, uh, the Northeast uh, section of our country. So um, as it says in this article, what you need to know about the Colonial Pipeline hack, uh, the breach of the United States most important pipeline companies has shined a spotlight on the growing threat of digital extortion schemes. Now here's the thing. Now, I'm going to break down this. Uh, we're going to go through um, this article as well as some others in regards to, you know, kind of uh, some of the things that actually took place. Because, you know, as a, you know, um, when you're doing a root cause analysis, you definitely want to get to uh, what truly happened versus what people thought happened in the beginning. Because there were a lot of, you know, hearsay um, articles that were put out in regards to exactly what was hacked, how it was hacked, what was shut down, you know, things of that sort. So one thing I want to say is that uh, ransomware, ransomware has been a while for quite some time. It's nothing new. Um, it's just the latest um, thing that's kind of caught the media's attention. But it's been a while, long. it's been around long before um, the introduction of Bitcoin, the introduction of any cryptocurrencies. Uh, actually, it used to take place uh, and they used to use, uh, what do you call those things? Um, uh, different trans transmission uh, railways, um, like uh, MoneyGram, Western Union, because those were the, the truly untraceable um, means of, uh, I guess, sending extortion payments. <laughs> uh, again, you guys got to forgive me. It's late over here. And um, we had quite a long day, but not making excuses. But the bottom line is that um, as of late, you know, this was kind of propelled into uh, the mainstream by the powers that be as a, you know, a continuation of the FUD um, that had been put out 
in regards to cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin in particular, you know, again, for standing for fear, uncertainty and doubt, uh, just, um, I, I look at it as a way of continuing to shake out uh, your regular investors. Um, you know, they call us the retail investors as a way to kind of scare people who may have been on the fence in regards to whether or not they wanted to, um, um, I guess, start investing into or start looking into um, getting into Bitcoin, getting into cryptocurrency. So um, this was another way to, if you're on the fence, kind of, you know, sway you in the other direction, in the opposite direction, so that, um, I, I guess the best way to say it, so that they can buy it up for themselves, you know. Uh, this is one of the... And I say this all the time, and I know I'm segueing, so I'll jump back on topic here in a minute. But um, this is one of the um, few, very few opportunities where everyday people can partake in what's coming next. You know, um, this is definitely uh, one of the very rare, and I've said that before, very rare wealth transfer events. And it's not able to be controlled you know it's they can't keep us out of this one uh, because of the nature and in, in, in the way in which you know bitcoin was designed with this decentralization so um when you can't keep it secret you know when we don't have inside uh, venture capital this um access you know the next best thing is just to scare the hell out of you you know to, to make it so that you're 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 afraid of it so that you won't want to touch it you know and again like i said not financial advice i'm not telling you what to do uh with your hard-earned money but when you understand what's coming next when you understand um the the the, the increasingly growing decay in the purchasing power of the current fiat currency um and you understand, you still really start to understand, you know, inflation versus a deflationary asset. And you understand when you have people um, in very high places who can truthfully just counterfeit um, currency, they can just print it at will, you know, um, for any reason whatsoever that they can, you know, deem justifiable, then you really start to grasp um, the why you know, uh, those of us who are uh, huge proponents of Bitcoin uh, believe in it the way that we do because it can't be controlled. Um, you can't inflate it away. You know, you can't magically produce more of it. You know, it's governed by a set of rules that's coded into, its, um, into the algorithm, into the protocols, and that can't be changed, um, not by any, you know, not by any one government, not by any one individual, not by any anything, you know. Um, so, and and again, I know I say wait off. I'm gonna circle. I'm gonna jump back onto uh, the topic here. But you know, just when you really have an understanding of that, you know, and then you start to see where, or actually, you start to see why um, it's so important that they keep you out of this. Because again, you know, the word elite, elite, you know, everyone can't be elite, unfortunately, in their minds. And things like Bitcoin are supposed to be reserved for the elite. You know, that we're not supposed to know about this. We're not supposed to be able to participate in this. So um, this gives us what I, what I guess kind of what I've always been hoping would happen. You know, because people talk about equality well equality is one of those vague terms you know i'm not i'm more a proponent for equal opportunity you know it made the best person come out ahead because in a true free market capitalist uh situation the the best people who are the most talented you know, in any competitive situation, you know, the people who are the most talented, um, the people who are the smartest, you know, truthfully, not because they have an unfair advantage, not because they were positioned 
you know, five steps ahead of everybody you know, from the starting line, but people who truly have the a, a, a equal opportunity to truly showcase their abilities can come ahead. Bitcoin gives you that, you know, um, no pre-mine, no, you know, a uh, group of people given a, a huge amount prior to its release, you know, it had to be from the, the very, from the first second that it was turned on, the software was released, you know, it had to be worked for just like any other, anything else that you've had to work for, you know, you, you know, so again, um, and, and again, I apologize, you know, I, I, I go off on tangents, just stay with me because <laughs> I promise you it all makes sense. But going back to the, uh, the colonial pipeline, uh, breach. So what's really important is understanding exactly, you know, what happened and how it happened and what all was impacted. So when we look at this article, you know, when we say, you know, how did computer hackers shut down the pipeline? Well, it says here on Friday, which, you know, this article is dated, uh, May 10th. So that would be the Friday prior to May 10th. Um, Colonial Pipeline said it learned that hackers had infected its computer networks with ransomware. Malicious code used to seize control of computers and extract uh, payments from victims. The breach affected Colonial's business networks, which is used for tasks such as managing payrolls and reporting data to regulators. Now, Colonial deactivated those systems, but it also shut off um, it also shut off the much more sensitive technology that runs its pipeline operations. A precaution, a precaution aimed at preventing the hackers from reaching it uh, if they hadn't already. These systems monitor the flow of gas for impurities and leaks, control power levels, and uh, perform other automated tasks to keep the pipeline running smoothly. So in essence, they hadn't, the ransomware basically just took down their ability to do administrative tasks. You know, it didn't actually uh, affect the systems that truly control the, the, the pipelines themselves. It just kind of uh, got them from a, you know, uh, I guess you could say like it, like we said, from an administrative task uh, standpoint, and like I said, um, it affected their business networks. You know, uh, they took the extra initiative by shutting down the pipelines itself, you know, by shutting down the, the, the critical systems, um, they decided to uh, make that move. So uh, going a little further down, it says what exactly was shut down. Well, they shut down in, uh, let's see, Colonial shut down this entire primary pipeline system, which it didn't have to, it just chose to. Let's remember that. Uh, which runs more than 5,500 miles from Houston, Texas, from Houston, Texas to Linden, New Jersey. This pipeline transports 45% uh, of gas, gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel for the east coast of the United States, according to the company. Now, this is all speculation based off of the information that we have right here. You know, the the big scare that we had where, you know, it actually created a gas shortage. We didn't actually have a gas shortage. From what I understand was that the uh, pipeline would have to have been offline for more than a week um, in order to truly have an effect in regards to um, gasoline supply. So we, this led to a gas shortage only because of um, the, the panic that uh, regular people had, you know, a lot of regular people uh, went out, same thing they did during the um, the initial lockdown stage, you know, when we had the, <laughs> the, the toilet paper shortage and the paper towel shortage, you know, because people are out panic buying. Uh, same situation here, you know, the media created a, a, a FUD type situation and put you know, invoked panic in regular people who weren't, you know, truly, I guess, informed on what was going on and what had been taking place and what was already, you know, the, the, the precautionary measures that were already happening. They just said, hey, they shut down the pipeline. You know, that affects gas to the, you know, the entire half of the country. And people was like, oh my God, we're not gonna have gas for, you know, three months. And they went out and started filling up I saw one lady fill up a plastic bag. Um, as you can see, 
What is that? Uh, that's a weird little container right there. It looks like some easy grow. <laughs> you know what the hell that is? But needless to say, you know, people just kind of went out and started uh, panic buying all because of, you know, a, that particular article. Now, <laughs> that was one part of the issue. The second part of the issue was, I guess, the ransom that was demanded. Now, the ransom that was demanded, uh, well, actually, before I get into that, um, let, let's go ahead and cover this one. I see this one article here about how the ransomware actually got into um, the network, like how they were actually, um, how the hackers were able, actually able to breach, uh, you know, uh, the Colonial Pipeline's um, infrastructure. Because one thing about uh, network security is that nothing's 100% impenetrable when we're dealing with computers. Our job as a uh, IT professional, is specifically someone who um, is involved with uh, information security, is to make it as hard as humanly possible to retrieve, you know, to get in, uh, to have access to those uh, critical systems. So as you can see here, it said the hackers reached the pipeline, the pipeline using compromised password and come to find out it was actually uh, a VPN account that had um, that hadn't been used. Um, from what I understand here in the article, let's go to it. Let's see, hackers gained entry into the network, uh, into the networks of Colonial Pipeline on April 29th through a virtual private network account, which allowed employees to remotely access the computer's company network. Now, the account was uh, no longer in use at the time of the attack, but it still had a, uh, the ability to access their network. So that, that's one red flag there because as anyone, again, who works in the IT field knows when, um, I want to say, they, they, we have uh, policies that we put in place that pretty much uh, define like inactive accounts, you know, so or people who are no longer with the company. So if an account generally has it been utilized in about 30 days, it will automatically get suspended. You know, it will automatically get deactivated. And if um, the user is still with the company and they decide to try to re, you know, excuse me, they try to access the account again, they'd have to go through a reactivation uh, process. Now, again, that's one security measure. Second security measure is as soon as someone is listed as no longer being with the company, that account immediately gets deactivated. You know, that, that's, that's a priority uh, ticket that goes in through the help desk and it gets sent over to InfoSec and, you know, so on and so forth. And the process of deactivating um, begins. So that was seemingly um, that was a failure in process, not knowing what their internal processes are. But that in, that in itself is a, is a failure in the process, given that that was an account that was no longer in use um, and they were able to gain access into the infrastructure. So now that kind of gives you a little bit for those who may have been wondering how they were able to actually get in that, that kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, provides a little, sheds a little bit more light onto that. Now, the next thing that I wanted to cover, and that's what I was talking about here was exactly how, um, the ransom was paid. So, uh, for those who don't know, um, the ransom, I guess there was a $5 million ransom that was paid to hackers. Okay. So it said Colonial Pipeline paid a ransom to hackers after the company fell victim to a sweeping cyber attack. Let's see. Now, one thing that they definitely um, made light of was that how um, they demanded the ransom. And that's where, you know, my antenna started to go off. Yes, I had some antennas that were you know, some red flags that were already triggered in regards to uh, the system being hacked. And then uh, understanding that, you know, the way it was hacked, you know, again, we just pointed out the failure uh, in the, um, the, I guess, dormant account uh, that hadn't been used. And that's how they were able to get in through a VPN account. Second thing is, oh man. <laughs> There's just, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot, you know, to process there, but you know, those were the initial red flags. The next red flag that came up 
was how they demanded payment. Now, according to uh, the articles, uh, they demanded payment of the ransom of $5 million. And I'm looking over at the, the article here. I'll pull it back up for you guys to see as well as I'm looking at it. But the ransom was set to have been demanded to be paid in Bitcoin. Now, that is a huge red flag for me, mainly because of the fact that um, Bitcoin is anonymous. It's not private. It's a 100% transparent network, meaning that every transaction that ever takes place on the Bitcoin network, on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, there's an open ledger. It can be tracked from A to Z for the next thousand years, you know, from the Genesis block, uh, the very first block that was ever mined on Bitcoin up until right now, this very second, the blocks that are being mined, you can track every transaction is open for the world to see another benefit of Bitcoin. But it's not a benefit of anyone looking for to use it in a malicious way. So it brings up some questions that I have and have had, you know, in regards to this entire process, because, you know, I'm not a hacker um, in, the, in the sense of a malicious hacker. You know, I've studied ethical hacking, the white hat hacking is what they call it. Um, I've studied white hat hacking. I can do certain things. You know, I used to tell people, I'm not one of the people that you really want to piss off um, because I I live and breathe computers, uh, coding. But bottom line is, you know, if I was a hacker, um, a a hacking organization, I think this one, this organization uh, in particular was known as Darkside, who evidently took um, credit for the hack, as it says here. Um, let's see, you have intelligence linking the dark side groups, ransomware attack to the Russian government, all that other stuff, whatever. But bottom line is it was attacked, you know, by a group known as the dark side. So, um, if I were a malicious hacker, if I'm smart enough and I, I have a, a quote, uh, somewhere around here that I want to, uh, reference to bring you guys into the fray. If I'm a malicious hacker and I have the ability to hack one of the most key pipelines in uh, the United States of all places, you know, if I'm smart enough to come up with um, the ability to do that, but at the same time, I'm not cognizant enough of, you know, the payment method in which I'm asking for the ransom to be paid you know, it, it just doesn't add up to me. It, it doesn't add up at all. And I say that because in addition to Bitcoin, we have a lot of privacy coins that exist on the, um, in the cryptocurrency space, you know, um, and one privacy coin in particular, and I think there's another one that just came out. Uh, I'm not going to name any names because, you know, I don't have to. If you guys want to get more information on that, you can look up privacy coins. But there's one privacy coin in particular that um, hasn't been cracked. Its encryption cannot be cracked. It's truly private. Um, and for me, being not a enterprise organization um, that goes around hacking, you know, for um, geopolitical, whatever type of purposes. Needed to say, me not being a criminal mastermind, um, knowing that we have privacy coins that are capable of not being tracked from start to finish. I'm pretty confident that the masterminds, these true geniuses who are capable of hacking a very key part of our nation's infrastructure, a company who, you know, over a few billion plus dollars worth of, uh, of a company, um, pretty confident they know that too. So for the ransom to ask to be having paid in Bitcoin, again, raises a red flag. Soon as I saw that they asked for it to be paid in Bitcoin, I, I, I no not happening, you know, not happening at all. Now here's another thing. Um, after, you know, the, the ransom was, or after the, the, the group, the dark side group 
at the, um, I guess successfully executed, you know, their hack and uh, demanded ransom, which was paid within hours, by the way. Um, you know, again, we already talked about how the company made the decision to shut down the key infrastructure, uh, the critical infrastructure, um, not because it had been compromised, but because they were wanting to ensure it hadn't been compromised and they had actually already paid the ransom. So the, what, four or five days that the pipeline was down, it didn't have to be down because this was all taken care of within hours. They actually had the systems restored and back online within hours. Um, but moving a step forward, and I, I may be off on my timeline here, but just walk with me. Um, the group actually made a press release <laughs> saying that they were shutting down after this key hack. And that was very interesting. So... According to the group themselves, they said a few hours ago, and by a few hours ago, this was from, you know, May 14th. So uh, a few hours ago, we lost access to the public part of our infrastructure. The, the message continues. Also, a few hours after the withdrawal, funds from the payment servers, our clients, ours and clients, were withdrawn to an unknown address. The group also claimed it released decryption tools to all companies. <laughs> it had attempted to extort, but had not yet been paid. So we're dealing with a enterprise criminal organization who are geniuses at hacking, but they have ethics. You know, because they lost access to, evidently, um, they lost access to their servers. Um, they decided that they were going to do the right thing. And the companies that they had already held hostage, they were just going to go ahead and, you know, uh, release the data and, and just, you know, eh, we're, we're sorry, guys. We, we didn't mean it. You know, we're, 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 we'll give you access to everything back. I'm not, I'm, another red flag, another red flag for one. Um, that's unheard of. I'm, I'm going to just put that out there. That's hundred percent unheard of. And, you know, for two, what, what organization makes press releases, you know, it, <laughs> they're leaving too much of a trail, leaving too much of a trail, but uh, let, let's get into the, the nuts and bolts of this. So they're saying that they lost access to um, the public part of their infrastructure. Now, from what I understand, and this is what I was able to uncover, they were running uh, rented uh, virtual servers in the cloud to orchestrate these types of attacks. And I can somewhat understand that from a, you know, jump box VPN type setup to where you want to re uh, remain as anonymous as possible. But let's move a little bit further. So, cause I don't want to get too far ahead of myself without showing you guys um, the actual sources in which I'm finding the data. So evidently um, the FBI was able to, going back to where they were saying that they lost access to the public part of the infrastructure, um, including uh, their payment server. So, it came out later on. This is on June 8th and we were going back from May 14th as of this article. So it came out that the FBI had evidently hacked the hackers and they were able to do so by, um, it originally it said that they had, um, but it said, it said that they had, yeah, it said they had hacked the Bitcoin wallet that the funds had been sent to. So it said the seizure on Monday uh, marked the first of its kind effort by a new Justice Department task force to hijack a cyber criminal uh, group's profits through a hack of its Bitcoin wallet. So they're literally saying that they were able to hack a Bitcoin wallet. Now, one thing that we know and one thing that is 100% true is that you're not going to hack the security of a Bitcoin wallet. It, it, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, it, it's going to take uh, the a extremely sophisticated high-end quantum computer to hack a Bitcoin wallet, um, which hasn't been developed yet. 
And at that point, I'm pretty confident that the Bitcoin developers will have a way of increasing um, the uh, private key security. But there's a, 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 a quote here I want to bring up. This was one too. And when I was talking about um, red flags, it says, so the hackers brought down the largest pipeline on the East Coast, but couldn't spend $50 on a clean hardware wallet to secure their Bitcoin. Now, the reason why um, this um, particular quote makes sense is because going back to where, what was it, this article? Uh, this article, where it was saying that they lost access to their payment server. Okay. Let's let's go into that a little bit. Um, and I'm I'm gonna I'm, I'm continuing to circle, make it bring it full circle for you guys. I know I'm bouncing around here, but I want to make sure I cover everything. So let's go into that. So they said they couldn't. They had lost access to their payment server. Now, getting a little bit deeper into that, evidently, the FBI, per their um, what the hell is it called, uh, seizure warrant, uh, which we were able to locate and pull up here uh, for anybody you can who wants to actually read the, the warrant that the FBI had issued, it's um, available to the public. But uh, according to the seizure warrant, they were able to, um, I guess, find the company that was hosting uh, the Bitcoin wallet, and they were able to find the server in which um, the private keys were stored. And... That's how they were able to, quote unquote, hack the wallet. So let's go back to the the quote uh, that we were talking about here, um, where it referenced them not being able to spend fifty dollars on a hardware wallet. So uh, this part here, uh, they couldn't spend fifty bucks on a clean hardware wallet to secure their Bitcoin. Okay, one more time, the fact that they've requested Bitcoin red flag. The fact that their payment server um, contained a hot wallet, another red flag. Um, I built um, Bitcoin payment servers. Um, all you really have to do is run a full node. Um, and there's a app called BTC pay. And it allows you to uh, accept payments in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. You know, if you can uh, configure it um, to accept other other cryptocurrencies, but it was initially developed to accept Bitcoin and BTC Pay, which is you know you can hold you can have a hot wallet on it and you can store your cryptocurrency for your vendors, you know, or whomever you're accepting payments for, including yourself. But it also gives you the option to connect a cold storage, a cold uh, hardware wallet, so that when you receive your payments, it automatically um, goes over to your, your hardware wallet. It doesn't house the, the crypto on the server itself in a hot wallet. That's a simple check entering your XPUB key to your, you know, your cold storage, um, your hardware wallet. And by the way, whenever I say cold storage, I'm talking about a hardware wallet, like a ledger or a treasure or something to that effect. But, you know, you check a box, um, you enter your XPUB key and you save it. And every payment that comes through that gets processed uh, via uh, that method, auto, you know, the, the payment server uh, automatically gets forwarded over to your hardware wallet. You can also send payments um in in the exact same way you know it's still connected to your hardware wallet you literally just confirm uh the payment on the hardware wallet when the request is made they have a a desktop application that you know allows you to do this seamlessly so again another red flag uh, when we talk about these guys are geniuses you know they were able to hack bring down you know, or cause, they didn't bring it down. They were able to cause a shutdown of, you know, the largest pipeline on the East Coast, but they didn't know how to configure their, their payment server. Very interesting. Very interesting. I'm going to let you guys 
you know, connect the dots on that. But for me, that's, that's very interesting and how that played out. So, um, from there we have where the department of justice, the, you know, or they said, they said the FBI was able to, uh, hack the hackers, you know, via their Bitcoin wallet because they were able to find out where the payment server was being um, hosted um, via the cloud hosting company. Uh, they were able to gain access to the server, recover the keys, hence recovering, uh, what was it, 2.3 million uh, of the 5 million ransom. So very interesting. Very, very interesting. Now, the reason why that was very important was because when that uh, news came out, of course, it affected the, the market because now we have a situation where people think that you can easily hack a Bitcoin wallet. You can easily hack a, a private key. You know, you can hack those, your, uh, your seed phrase. And as we now know, that's not true. They didn't hack a Bitcoin wallet. They were basically able to get into the, Suppose it payment server that housed the private keys of where the ransom payment was sent. So very, very important that we know that. Now there's one other thing I want to bring up in regards to, before I talk about uh, Bitcoin security, I wanted to talk about um, the hash phrase. So actually, you know what, let's just roll on into the Bitcoin security, um, uh, the wallet security. Uh, so. This is a very important thing I want you guys to know. Very, very important. And I have it highlighted here. It says, when I tell you a Bitcoin private key is a 256 bit number, you see the 256 and think it's relatively small. In reality, 256 bits means two to the 256 power. That'd be two times two, you know, and continuing on to the different exponents, two times two times two times two times two. So basically there are that many possible private keys expanded out two to the 256 is this extremely long number right here. So, and as it notes right below it, it says based on comp uh, current computing power, a conservative estimate puts a brute force attack or a brute force wallet attack taking 0.65 billion, billion years, not billion years, but billion, billion years. That's probably the amount of time it takes to get to the sun. <laughs> you won't happen in your lifetime. Let's put it that way. So uh, for anybody who was thinking that, you know, you can, you know, it, it, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with a brute force attack is, but basically what it is, is, is that you just bombard the security of uh, a particular object or a particular thing with just random characters trying to figure out what the password is. So, um, with the Bitcoin wallet, like it says here, it's two to the 256 power. So good luck just, you know, and, and to, to, to be honest with you, you, we have, I'm pretty confident that since, you know, Bitcoin's inception, there have been an ongoing brute force, that's brute force attack in an attempt to try to, uh, crack into Satoshi's wallet because Satoshi's wallet, um, has over a million Bitcoin sitting in it right now, just, just dormant and not moving, uh, hasn't been moved since they were initially mined. So if it were that easy, you know, it would have been done by now and Bitcoin would be at zero. It would be a useless uh, asset. Now, going a little bit deeper, uh, when it talks about, you know, um, first, the uh, first section here says what makes Bitcoin secure? And, you know, we're going to cover basically what we just talked about in the 256 uh, bit encryption, but, it all, and I'll, I'll just read it from, you know, the beginning, then we'll talk about uh, the possibility of Bitcoin network being breached uh, via 54% attack, but since Bitcoin technology is the online security infrastructure of Bitcoin and other digital currencies that prevent value uh, being sent across the network from being stolen, dupli uh, duplicated, or destroyed. The strength of the Bitcoin network lies in the high degree of trust, uh, confidence, and transparency of all transactions. The Bitcoin network is protected by uh, SHA-256 encryption for both its proof of work uh, system and verification of transactions that removes the possibility of duplicate transactions. That's where we have the, the proof of work is where the miners reside and the verification of transactions are where the uh, full nodes reside. So basically what happens is uh, from a proof of work standpoint, the miners 
um, who are awarded um, block uh, a block reward for correctly uh, figuring out the computational code uh, for that particular uh, ten minute block. Uh, it gets verified on the network by the full nodes. Uh, full nodes can be ran by anybody. You know, again, in order to run a payment server, you're running something uh, a resemblance of a full node. They give you the option to whether you want to run a, a half node or, you know, a partial node. But overall, you can uh, run a full node on your own uh, and it requires not a whole lot of computing power. You know, the computing power, which we uh, refer to as hash rate, uh, comes in if you're actually looking to mine Bitcoin. So anyway, just kind of want to let you guys know that the, the difference of the two, the proof of work versus the transaction verification. Um, so where the hell was I? All right, each transaction is usually encoded uh, with the specific transaction details that include the previous owner of the Bitcoin being sent the specific amount and the BTC address of the recipient. As a result, it is not possible to duplicate transactions or spend money twice, which is also known as a double spend on the network. Each transaction is encoded with the hash identifier that comprises of a unique string of characters that are verified and added to the blockchain. This information is broadcast across a vast network of computers known as nodes. This is what I was talking about when I was saying you guys can run your full nodes. The computer nodes, uh, uh, the, the computer networks continuously check and verify that the records are accurate uh, therefore, a large number of nodes around the world would need to be compromised uh, to hack the Bitcoin network. Now, that's to hack the Bitcoin network. So you ask yourself a question. Well, how when it says a large number of nodes uh, would be needed in order for this to take place, how many exactly? Well, there's no set number. This is where it comes into um, the hash rate. Now, this is what's known as a 51% attack. So we go to the next section. It says, how can Bitcoin be breached? Now, the decentralized nature of Bitcoin uh, makes Bitcoin extremely difficult for unauthorized third parties to access Bitcoin transactions. A low likelihood, very low, but potentially possible scenario, excuse me, to breach Bitcoin is using a 51% network attack. Hackers would need to compromise miners that control more than 50% of the Bitcoin's um, network's mining hash rate. This would allow the hackers with majority control of the network to interrupt the validation of, of new blocks and preventing other miners from completing blocks. Now, smaller networks that use proof of work and have a smaller hash rate uh, can be vulnerable to a 51% attack. We talked about that when we spoke of Ethereum Classic. Oh, it actually says in the next sentence. <laughs> uh, for example, Ethereum Classic was compromised three times uh, last year uh, by a 51% attack in September 2020. Uh, the attack compromised over 14,000 blocks um, on the network that resulted in a double in double spending of 807 uh, ETC, uh, which is valued around $5.6 million. This is why um, uh, Charles Hoskinson, we spoke about this when we talked about Ethereum versus Ethereum Classic, you know, what are the differences of the two? And this is why Charles Hoskinson, the creator of Cardano, uh, the dedicated an entire team to improving the security of Ethereum Classic because he was one of the true believers of Coda's Law. And for those who aren't familiar, Ethereum Classic came into B because uh, there was a major hack of a uh, of the uh, DAO on the original Ethereum chain, and the developers uh, had a majority vote to fork. Um, uh, the, the original Ethereum chain over to what we now know as Ethereum and um, remove um, the blocks uh, where the hack had actually taken place. So they basically reset the chain. And um, those who didn't agree um, stayed with the original chain and they, you know, again, stood behind the Codis Law uh, theory where whatever happens, happens and it stays and you correct it. And again, this is how Ethereum versus Theory Classic came into play. So Charles Hoskinson uh, was a firm believer in Codis Law. You don't, you know, uh, roll back uh, the, the blockchain because in essence, you know, it takes away the whole purpose of a uh, decentralized uh, blockchain, you know, with no one controlling entity. And he dedicated an entire team to helping to uh, increase the security, increase the, you know, um, the, I guess, the entire state of Ethereum Classic uh, so that uh, those 51% attacks, um, I'm not gonna say that they won't happen again, but they become uh, very difficult in order to happen. 
So um, we basically just, you know, uh, explain what a 51% attack was. Now, given that Bitcoin is so um, globally decentralized and there are huge, 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 huge um, mining farms all over the world, you know, the United States is definitely uh, one of the um, major players, uh, especially increasing uh, the number of uh, mining operations uh, to um, further help decentralize hash rate across the globe. Um, the, the possibility, although still presents itself, is slim to none of that happening on Bitcoin's network, again, because of how decentralized um, Bitcoin is. You know, um, people always say that China uh, controls more than 50%. Well, we have more than 50% of the hash rate in China, but in order to coordinate something of that scale, it wouldn't benefit them either. Because we also have to look at it from, um, you know, a, sorry, I saw something on my beard. But <laughs> we also have to understand that, you know, outside of just bringing down the entire network, you know, there are billions of dollars invested in, you know, Bitcoin and mining equipment. There's billions of dollars invested in, you know, this particular asset, not to mention there's currently, uh, there it was over a trillion dollars um, market cap, which means there's over a trillion dollars of value sitting on top of Bitcoin's network. It would not be beneficial to anybody, any one country to bring Bitcoin down, especially looking at the, the number of investment in it. So, there are so many reasons why the attack wouldn't happen despite it being a possibility, uh, which is why I say it's pretty slim to none because there's truly no benefit for a, a large group because again, it would take a large group, you know, multiple countries at this point uh, to uh, coordinate such a, 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 an event, to coordinate such a, a situation. So, you know, in short, um, Bitcoin is definitely the most secure uh, proof of work uh, blockchain in existence uh, as we know it. Um, and for those people who are saying that, you know, um, this new coin is better than Bitcoin, so on and so forth, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Um, yeah, definitely not going to happen. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. You know, not going to happen. Um, oh, going back to what I was talking about, uh, this is Adam Beck. Uh, Adam Back is the, is the CEO of CoinDesk, I think. Um, don't quote me on that, actually. Let me find out. Let me confirm that real quick. Give me a sec, guys. I want to make sure I quote him uh, specifically because... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's the CEO of Blockstream um, is what he is. But he kind of, you know, um, uh, I guess second the notion of, you know, Bitcoin wallet wasn't hacked. Uh, and as he uh, stated on Twitter, says Bitcoin was not hacked, no Bitcoin wallet was hacked, nor is even uh, known to be possible, uh, as we just proved, uh, kind of confirming his statement. Uh, random hackers use a rented cloud server. Why they would do that? But anyway, uh, the FBI got a subpoena and took control of it and recovered coins. That's it. So as we show, um, via the the seizure warrant here, uh, which I guess is the subpoena. Um, that's kind of how that all took place. So, um, yeah, no, Bitcoin wasn't hacked. We've shown in many different ways why it wasn't hacked. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna close out. I close out by saying that. Oh, this is just me, my opinion. This is purely speculation on my part. Um. I don't think this was orchestrated by a true um, criminal organization that specializes in hacking. I don't think this is what took place here. I think this was uh, something to add to the fear. Um, the fear of cryptocurrencies being, you know, a true disruptive technology, something that is an actual threat to the banking system as we know it. And I think this is um, a false flag. Again, my true, only my opinion, you know, but it just doesn't add up. You know, I'm, as I said before, I'm not a 
world class. And we're talking about some of the smartest people on the planet, you know, that can hack our entire lives from their cell phone if they wanted to, you know, being able to infiltrate a, a the lar- one of the largest pipelines, the largest pipeline on the Northeast of a, of a major country, you know, the world's superpower at the moment and not being smart enough to know to ask for ransom in the privacy coin. I think this was in a coordinated, orchestrated um, situation in order to um, shed some more negativity on Bitcoin. As we got, as you guys all know, we had the the whole, you know, green uh, renewable energy uh, FUD that was um, headed up by Elon, you know, just adding on to the whole um, negative light being shined on Bitcoin. So I think this was just adding on to it. The saying that, you know, um, what was it? 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 Oh, when we had some um, central bank leaders saying that, you know, um, Bitcoin is being used for illicit activities even though there's proof, you know, given shown by Glassnode, who is a data analytics, you know, an on-chain analytics firm that confirms that, you know, less than, what was it, 0.1% of uh, Bitcoin transactions at this moment is being used for illicit activities, mainly because of the fact that everything's 100% transparent. You know, there is no privacy uh, on this particular network. There's uh, anonymity. You know, you can be anonymous until someone finds out what your address is, but there's no privacy on the Bitcoin network at all. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not buying it. You know, I, I, I like to try to think as logically and as open-minded as humanly possible. And the logic just doesn't make sense in this entire particular situation. It doesn't make sense at all. You know, I, I know people who, are absolute novices when it comes to cryptocurrency who immediately was like, well, why the hell did they ask for it in Bitcoin? That doesn't make sense. Why would they ask for it in a privacy coin? If they know about it and these people are novice to the cryptocurrency space, I promise you the smartest people on the planet know about it also. Again, going all the way back to how they were saying that they, you know, had hot wallets on an online uh, payment system, payment server. Payment servers can be configured to use cold storage. They can be configured to use hardware wallets to send and receive payments. So, and I know this for a fact because I've built payment, you know, payment systems utilizing uh, cryptocurrency. So, yeah, not buying it. But that's today's episode of Crypto Talk Tuesday. I want to thank you guys for joining and. I want to say one more thing and totally not related to anything other than just me sharing something with you guys right now that, um, it's going to be heavy on my mind lately. So since last week when I had the, the issue, you know, with the weather and knocking out some of my network equipment, uh, causing a delay, causing us to miss an entire week of, um, giving you guys, uh, information, hopefully great information that you're really taking advantage of and utilizing. Um, I was just thinking, You know, are you, for me, and I'm asking you guys the same question, um, I had to ask myself, do I really enjoy what I do? You know, um, is me, you know, sitting here researching all of this information, you know, sharing it with you guys um, for no other reason than just, hey, look what I uncovered and I want you guys to know about it because for a lot of, a lot of situations we're the last to know and being the last to know is never a good thing. So I had to ask myself, do I really enjoy what I do? Do I enjoy, you know, computer engineering? Do I enjoy uh, designing enterprise networks? Do I enjoy coding, you know, coding apps, coding websites? Do I enjoy researching? Do I, do, do I just, every morning that I wake up, do I wake up excited about, you know, going to do what it is that I do? And my answer to that question is yes, I love it. I have a true passion for it. And I want to ask you guys that exact same question. Do you enjoy what you do? 
you know, when you wake up in the morning, are you excited about what the day uh, has in store for you? Or are you only excited about Friday? And when Monday rolls around again, you know, you don't want to get out of bed. You know, I really want you guys to think about that because one thing that is absolute, yes, we need money to function in the society. We need money to, you know, provide ourselves with a, a particular quality of life that we want. But at the end of the day, we have a choice. We, we truly have a choice. And I, I want to know, are you guys choosing to do something that you love? Or are you a slave to your material wants? You know, really, really, honestly, God, I really think about that question, you know, and if the answer is the latter, then ask yourself, what are you going to do to fix it? Because if you're not doing something that you truly love to do, if you're not doing something that every morning makes you want to get up and do it, or you have the choice every morning whether or not you want to get up and do it you know because if i want to take the day off i'll, I'll lay in bed and i get up you know I'll, I'll do all my work from my phone laying in my bed and you know other times i'm be sitting in my you know, upstairs in my office um you know grinding out so we have the choice and if what you're choosing to do isn't what you want to do is it if it isn't fulfilling to you if it isn't something that's adding to your happiness because only you can make you happy and that comes from the inside so if the choices that you're making uh, when you have to get up every morning aren't fulfilling if they aren't what you truthfully want to do then it's time to put things into play to correct that to put yourself in a position so that you are doing what you want to do. You know, if all you want to do is lay in the bed and watch TV all day, well, you understand it is going to come with a level of financial security in order to be able to do that. So what are you doing to put yourself in a financially secure position so that you can lay in the bed all day and watch TV? You know, if you truly want to help people, if you feel like that's your calling, is to be a community servant, you know? Well, what is it that you're doing to position yourself so that you can be just that without feeling like you have to do it? Again, having the choice. You know, I like to tell people that my pursuit uh, in life is to have options. I like to have the option. You know, when I wake up every day, I want to have the option of whether or not I want to do something. At the end of, at the, end of the day, that's, what it, that's really what it really all boils down to. I don't want to feel like I have to do anything. And I just, you know, I like to know that I chose to do this today. So again, I just kind of wanted to leave you guys with that. Um, it was heavy on my mind, uh, especially right up until I started the this particular session, you know, uh, me and my girlfriend, we were laying in the bed uh, watching the Dennis Rodman documentary of all things. Uh, it was a really good documentary. And just looking at how, you know, he really just spent the most of his life trying to please people. He didn't know who he was. He got put into a position to where he didn't have the choice to leave, you know. And it really got me to thinking, like, Am I in a position to where I have those options? I can do anything I want to do because I want to do it. Or am I being forced to do something? And not necessarily forced by a particular person, but forced, you can be forced by your responsibility. You know, you can be forced uh, because you have kids that you have to take care of. You can be forced because, you know, you've acquired a particular materialistic, material things that, you know, demand um, upkeep. They demand you go to work in order to continue to have them, in essence, making you a slave to those things. So, you know, if you're not excited or if you're not, you know, looking forward to the day ahead, every morning that you wake up, then you have that choice. You have the option to change it. 
Go change it. Y'all be good, man. I'll see y'all next Tuesday. We out of here. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. I gotta get y'all to Russell Simmons. I gotta get y'all to Russell Simmons. Thank you for coming out. God bless you. Good night. <laughs>